Welcome to the Welcome to the Roost News. This is Nancy McCammon Hansen. I'm a Roost News volunteer in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And today um, we're going to be talking with Chandra Weigel, who uh, is an AARP Associate State Director in Houston, Texas. So welcome, Chandra. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for having me. Our topic today is um, the AARP Houston, Texas program on genealogy. So I, I am very interested in genealogy and have been for a long time. Why would a state AARP office want to do programs on genealogy? So uh, doing these types of programming uh, combats a lot of issues that we talk about. Uh, one of the things we uh, do talk about is uh, addressing isolationism. And, you know, when you get started with genealogy, one of the everybody that we've ever had as a guest uh, will recommend talking to the older members of the family and uh, connecting with them to get that journey started with uh, research. Uh, the other thing is, is just uh, that continuous uh, education. Uh, our founder was an educator. And one of the things we've learned that I've learned by being here at AARP is that uh, the more we learn, the more we know it helps us in our daily lives. And so uh, knowing and understanding you, where you came from, your family background can be a useful tool for uh, living your best life and being able to get the best out of what life has to offer. So when did you start this program? So uh, um, next month I will be um, I will be ten years at AARP. Uh, we started doing this around 2016, 2017, uh, and it started with um, we we reached out. Well, I reached out to the Houston Public Library because in my community I always saw the Family Research, the Family History Research Center uh, at a library, the Clayton Library, which is uh, located in Houston's uh, Museum District, and I always saw that and wanted to get to know more about what they did there and how we could. Um, how we could start working with them. So we started back then, and this was way before the pandemic. We were not doing anything virtually. This was back in the days when we would, uh, you know, we would get a small area to meet in and we would send out our exact target. We would send out our mailers and we did two events with them and we had a spread of food and uh, things ready for folks to come. And the first one we did, it was well attended. Uh, some of the ones we did um, subsequently were not so well attended just because Houston's traffic and getting across town. So that, that was when we initially started. And then, um, and we did that one for the general audience. Everybody could, we, we invited everybody. It was a general audience thing. It was just basically how to better use the Clayton Library. That's what it initially started off as. And um, I created a wonderful working relationship with one of the uh, leaders at the library. And uh, she started uh, telling me more about these other organizations if we wanted to reach out and do more in uh, communities of color. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, I don't know if you realize this or know this, but in Fort Wayne, Indiana has the second largest genealogy library in the nation. And at about the time that all of this came up, we did a tour, uh, an AARP member tour of the Genealogy Center, and it was a big hit. So we're going to continue to do those once or twice a year. Um, do you work with genealogy centers in other parts of the country at all? So uh, I do work with people who, who have done genealogy research. Um, there is one for the uh, Chinese American community. We work with a woman who, she's out of New York. Her name is uh, Amy Chen. And uh, she has done two offerings for us, one this year and one last year. And uh, they were pretty well attended. We actually got those. Uh, now that we're doing all of this virtually, and what we found is doing these virtually work really well because we can draw links in the chat people can capture that stuff we can and people can sit right at home on their home computers and, and and get all of this wonderful information and leads to how to get started so uh we will probably keep those uh virtually but yes i've worked with um and this person is with the let's see I didn't, so she did, a, a, her offering was called uh, Asian American Family Secret, Secrets uh, Hidden in Plain Sight. 
Um, and as I said, she was from New York. I don't know that she was tied to a particular organization, but uh, we have worked with her. And then this year, we actually offered a um, genealogy um, offering for the Filipino community. And this was with the Filipino American National Historical Society, and they're based here in Houston. So we were working with them as well. Now, that's interesting to me that that um, Asians would have genealogy connections in Texas, because you don't think of Texas as being a place where people with an Asian background um, would be living. Yes, there are quite a few Asians uh, in uh, Texas. Uh, we actually have a larger Vietnamese community. Um, but yes, there are quite a, a, a few Asians in, in, in Houston. In fact, we also have worked with the Child Foundation, which is based out of Rice University. And they have started a collection of stories. And these stories are capturing uh, Asian Americans and their journey and how they got to Houston. So uh, some of them, as you probably think, came through New York, some came through other uh, 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 states, uh, but uh, the point was to get all these stories in one place and to kind of carry that history from this generation to the next generation. Uh, one year we partnered with them and they did a, a offering and talked to us about the collection they have and how people can find it and all of it's online, uh, but it, it's a wonderful collection of stories. Lillian Lee, who has the Roost News, um for all of AARP, uh, mentioned to me that your uh, program references using the five senses to find your family. And I, th I thought that sounded so interesting because I've never heard of that. Could you explain that to us? So this one, this one was uh, done, this was uh, back to the Clayton Library Partnership. Uh, one of the um, the staff members there, Susan, I uh, can't think of her last name, but her name is Susan. And she turned me on to the Afro-American uh, Genealogy and Historical Society. And there was a, there's a gentleman now named Franklin Smith who retired from the Clayton Library and he teaches that course. And what he, what he has done is taken how he researched his own family and turned that into a PowerPoint deck. And he, I think he's even published a book, uh, but he talks about how you uh, use those five senses and that one gets a big turnout it gets a very diverse turnout because uh like you they were very curious to know well how in the world do you use your five senses to start researching your family and he starts off talking about you know the site and uh, looking up stuff uh, or finding a place in your home to start uh, collecting things and keeping it in, in that one place and then he talks about listening connecting with those uh elders in the family um and and, you know, some of these stories for some families can be um, can be funny and joyful and some can be kind of painful. Uh, but just uh, starting there and then uh, he talks about touch. And so touch comes in when you're going when you go to the archives and you're looking up this information, you're looking through legal documents, you're looking through uh you know, uh, deeds and wills and things like that to try to find, is there a pattern, is there a line here? And then the smell, uh, the smell and the taste were the uh, two most interesting. And uh, he does a one a much better job and I'm not gonna try to recreate how he talks about the taste part of it or or something doesn't smell right uh, rather. Uh, he, uh, he says that some of the family stories you may get, it may not, it just may not sit right with you. It may not, it may not taste or smell right. And sometimes if you delve into those a little bit more, you'll find out that sometimes, you know, the truth has been, you know, kind of, you know, sugar-coated in order to keep people from getting feelings hurt and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so that, that one is a very interesting class. And I must say, um, before I forget, is that uh, the Afro-American uh, Genealogy and Historical Society, they have done a really creative job of bringing us additional content. Um, and some of the offerings um, have been um, 
while they focus on the African American community, they did one called Follow the Money. And how do you go down to the courthouse and find out um, more about your family history and what did they own and how did they come by it, you know? And uh, another offering they have was My DNA, What's Next? And that one was, that one we did this year. And um, the woman actually had a genetics test done and she walked people through how to upload this data into the different uh, platforms in order to find family members. And I thought that one was probably one of the more creative um, things that we've done around that whole genealogy and get to the, to, uh, you know, what's going on with your family. And then the last one, uh, we do this one around Juneteenth, it's called Finding Emancipation. And what that one does is uh, you're looking through old newspapers, you're looking through archives to try to uh, locate family members. And that can be, that can be replicated with any group. They just happen to do it for, um, for uh, African Americans. They, they talk more about that. Um, and as you know, at AARP, all the offers that we have are open and welcome to everyone. So we don't, you know, while it may say one thing in the title, everybody is uh, welcome to attend. And I got to tell you, one of the nicest things I've, I've heard after these genealogy offerings, whether it be in the Asian community or the African-American or general, people walk away saying how much they learned and how much they appreciate the offerings. And in, in listening to you talk about this, um, my family background is English and Irish. Okay, and my my younger sister um, does a lot of genealogy things, and she's married to someone named O'Brien. They mm -hmm. went to Ireland a few years ago, and she found out that the McCammons are more Irish than his branch of the O'Briens, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but if you're Asian versus African American versus Irish, are there different ways that those different ethnicities would go about? researching their their um their heritage or is it basically all the same Absolutely. So that was one of the things we learned with partnering with uh, the Clayton Library. And, um, you know, while we're all immigrants, we got, you know, we're here now, uh, but all of us have a different journey as to how we got to this country. So um, I, I know for the Asian uh, community, a lot of that was done, I want to say through, it was one of the bigger churches that, uh, that kind of holds all of that data and information. Um, I can't, I can't think of it. Um, and then for African Americans, uh, it's a little bit more of searching um, and searching through, you know, legal documents, going to old newspaper archives, going to old information, trying to trace, like, uh, you know, who were those families that owned this particular family of people, and how did they get broken up and brought back together, and whatnot. So, uh, so yeah, it is very, very different. Um, a lot of the, um, and what they found, a lot of the things for, um, you know, a lot of white people can find their information a little bit easier uh, than sometimes African Americans can. But I do think with 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 the DNA, uh, the rise of the DNA collections and and people seeking out more information, they are finding a little bit of a better time of locating family members, and from there they're able to piece things together. You mentioned the DNA uh, testing, and and I have done that, and mm -hmm. I I now get um, a number of messages. Um, so and so is could be your third or fourth cousin, and you share less than one percent DNA, which I, I don't know how you could be related that way, but ancestry says you are. Do you recommend contacting those people who might be a cousin, or should you just kind of back off and not um, contact them? So um, the I will go based on what I've learned since doing uh, this work. Uh, one of the uh, presenters, uh, she would always say, don't reach out. In fact, don't start this until you're ready, until you're ready to learn things about your family. And sometimes this information that you learn can be hurt, hurtful. Sometimes it can be a joyous experience. So it really is up to the person and their you know, current situation as, as far as if you should reach out or not. Uh, but I, I feel like if you've gone that step, 
to have your DNA co collected and then uploaded into one of these databases that you're probably at the point of, you know, you're just curious at this point and you want to know more. So, you know, go for it if it's right for you. It, it amazes me the, the surnames that, that come up with your cousins <laughs> that <laughs> you've never heard before. Um, have you re researched your own ancestry? So on my mom's side, I have an aunt who's done all of that for us. Uh, she's actually still alive. I'm going to see her in December. Uh, she's about 80, and uh, she's the youngest um, of, of, her, of her family, uh, of our elders, and uh, one of two that are left. And so um, she is the collector. She's always been the collector of this information. She loves uh, Ancestry.com. She's found a lot of family members through using that database uh, to a certain extent. Um, working and having to, so my family was born in rural East Texas, and many of them didn't have like proof of their birth. They were, uh, you know, born by midwives. And so whenever we, and whenever I was taking care of my mom, I would have to go back to the courthouse in those small towns and locate what they call school census. And so uh, whenever I would go, she would have me to send all that stuff to her. So I would, all the data and stuff that I would find just, you know, looking for proof of age and, 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 and birth, uh, I would send to her. So she's the collector of that. Now, my dad's side, uh, we have not been that diligent in, 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 in you know, connecting and, and doing that type of research. That's interesting. I did not realize um, until I started researching my father's stepmother, mm -hmm. um, whose first husband was from Cuba, and he disappeared during the Spanish Civil War, and she remarried. Um, they never did find out what happened to him. And I didn't realize that she didn't have to have him declared dead or, or anything like that. It was in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And I, I never knew that you know, people didn't have birth certificates till just now. I th I think that's really interesting how how much paperwork we have now, um, but that you know a number of years ago just didn't exist, which is in interesting, but seems a little odd in this day of of so much paperwork in our lives. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> ha have any of the people you've been vi you visited with found anything uh, in their research that was um, interesting or odd or was such a surprise to them that that they wanted to share it with people so yes mr franklin smith um so you're gonna make me talk about how he talked about the smell part of his uh, presentation so one of the things uh one of the big myths he said in in the african-american community is saying that you know, there was Native American in his lineage, uh, and I've and I've heard that all my life with different family members, and different families in my church saying the same thing. And so he went back and he started collecting these photos, and he ran across a photo of the white family that owned his great 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 grandmother, and he put those two pictures next to each other, and it was jaw dropping. And this particular gentleman was not of any Native American ancestry, but that was how much she looked, the, the features that she had that was passed down to even him. Even when you would look at him, he had that same nose, that same jawline and everything. And so he he put all these pictures next to each other and next to the this 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 family that owned their family. And it was it was astounding. And he and that's where the smell came in. He said if something doesn't smell right, then go back and do research. Look and that's where those photos are really, really important in trying to uh, locate those and uh figure out because uh, sometimes you can just see just by putting a photo next to each other like, oh my God, these people are related somehow, you know? So I thought that one was the probably the most interesting story that I've heard. And I've heard that presentation at least four or five times. You know, that's interesting. Um, when we first moved to Fort Wayne 17 years ago, I met one of the genealogists at the genealogy library because his uh, wife was part of the process of getting my husband hired. And uh, he told me that we had a common ancestor, which mm -hmm. really surprised me because McCammon's not that 
common a name, but um, apparently it is in Indiana. I did not know that. Um, but I also had commented to him one time how much my maternal great grandmother and her sons looked like they were Native American. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that a lot of the British look that way too. Mm -hmm. And the background of that family was 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 British. So I th that really surprised me because uh, you wouldn't think Native Americans and the British would would share um, looks, but apparently they do. <laughs> um, do the younger people that you know, or like the, the grandchildren of, of senior citizens, the AARP members, do, do they care about their genealogy? That is a that is an interesting question. Like I, so I, um, among my friends, um, I would probably say not so much. They can probably go back as far as maybe grandparents, and I know with my nieces, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> so uh, that I think that is our charge as AARP is to kind of uh, get the folks who are our members and friends to um, start talking about that. And that was and everybody we've done. Um, we, we've partnered with for genealogy has talked about that go back and sit your younger people down and talk to them and and that's how that's why the uh whole uh telling your story and 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 communicating and and sitting down and because all of us are stuck in our phones like even at some of our volunteer meetings everybody is sitting and playing on their phones and it's like it's a human sitting next to you talk to that human so uh so one of the things i think which is left up to aarp is because we we are everything we try to be everything to everybody which is great and so one of those things we can do is like push that whole notion of sitting down with that younger generation and talking to them uh we also have another offering that we do around um around uh uh, property and transfer of property. And one of the things they tell us too: sit down and talk to your family members, find out if they even want that stuff. And so if we, if we as AARP can encourage uh, the folks who follow us and come to our events and, and by the way, our virtual stuff is still, still doing very well at AARP. And those folks who are listening in like, Hey, sit down, make those young people put the phone down and talk to them. You know, and one day they they will miss that. As a person who has lost both both parents, I miss those. I miss those long crazy stories. When I was younger, I thought they were crazy, and I didn't want to listen to them. But I would give anything to hear those stories again. I understand completely. Um, the genealogy library here uh, appreciates it when people donate yearbooks, mm -hmm. and so our son who who did not want his high school yearbooks. Um, donated his. I donated my college yearbooks. I'm still hanging on to my high school yearbooks because when I see a picture of somebody on my hometown Facebook page, sometimes I have to go back to the yearbook to see what they used to look like because they've changed so much. <laughs> um, what kinds of things should you keep versus the things that you could get rid of as you're downsizing, hopefully? Um, what what is what is worth it to keep and what can go away? So what I've learned in doing this work, and by the way, you're talking to a very proud paper hoarder. Uh, what I've learned in doing this work is that um, you know baptismal papers, deeds, wills, things like that, you you do want to hold on to them, and I think the IRS even encourages keeping those as long as possible. Um, you know, birth certificates, um, death certificates. Um, you know, uh, any type of anything that you own that, you know, you paid more than ten or fifteen thousand dollars for, you may want to want to hold on to those things. Um, but that just be very like di uh, diligent and intentional about uh, telling people where those papers are. One of the things that I learned when I started AARP is that people did a great job of having that those important documents in safe places, but they would utilize like bank uh, uh, safety, uh, bank safety boxes, but no one had the key. They had a will, but no one knew where the will was. So the important thing is while you are holding on to those things, you want to let people know like, hey, look, this is where this is in case something happens to me. 
uh, a year doesn't go by that I get a call from one of the chapter members saying, you know, somebody who had all the paperwork from this chapter, you know, is now sick or in hospice or has passed away. And we don't know how to get this information back without being, you know, um, coming across as being kind of tacky, but uh, yeah, we always want to let people know like, hey, look, this is where this is. This belongs to so-and-so if anything happens to me to do that. And as a single woman with no children, I, you know, one of the things I've learned is that you have to, uh, as a single person, and if you don't have children, you got to find a niece or nephew or cousin or friend and, and pass that information on to them as well. Very true. Very, very true. Uh, anything else you'd like to add about the, your genealogy study? This has been really fun. So yes, uh, I am. Uh, this is the perfect time to do this. We're gearing up for, we're doing state planning, as you well know, as a volunteer, we're doing state planning and I'm preparing to do, uh, you know, a repeat or, or somewhat of a repeat of this stuff for next year. So visit us at aarp.org forward slash Houston. Um, I'm going to probably reach out to, to, to most of these groups and maybe add, go back to Clayton and add some general um, some some general uh, information for folks here in Houston who want to use the Clayton Library. And by the way, after the pandemic happened, the Clayton Library moved a lot of their stuff where you could access it online. So, and I think as did many libraries and other places. So, yes, um, doing things online has is thank God we can do that. So absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you, Chandra, for being our guest today. This is this has been very interesting, and uh, we may be in touch personally again about some different phases of uh, genealogy research. So, um, this is Nancy McCammon Hansen. I am a Roost volunteer out of Fort Wayne. Chandra Wyatt Weigel has been our um, guest today. Chandra's from Texas, Houston, Texas. Yes, and. Um, we welcome feedback about our Roost posts. Um, we are on YouTube. We have a post a podcast. Excuse me, my voice is going. So you can subscribe to us and uh, let us know what you think of our, our different uh, podcasts. And um, it's been nice talking with you, Chandra. And everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having me.